Thanks very much. Lovely to be here today. I'm from the Information Studies Department at UCL. I'm not heavily invested in the open access community. I teach digitisation. I research both the techniques for digitisation and also the use of digitised resources in libraries, art galleries and museums. But I'm here today really because I wrote something that might have gone a wee bit viral. So I'm here to talk about how I personally have used open access and social media to disseminate some of the research that I I have actually done. Um, like many academics, I have a digital presence these days, and I think it's a, important to have a digital presence. As well as my UCL pages, I have a blog, and it does okay. I get about 200, 250 hits a day. On average, people stay for a minute, so they're actually reading stuff. But it's fine, I try and update it once a week. I'm also glued to, um, oh sorry, to, so this is the kind of thing that I put on my blog. It's when I give a speech like this, if it's a plenary speech, I might write out the text. So as soon as I step off the podium, I hit go and it's there. I don't have to wait two years for it to come up. So it's very much a, a longer space for me to put stuff which is um, in the moment and right there. But I also hang out on Twitter quite a lot. And that's for the more shorter things like, hey, I'm at this event here. I'm tweeting it. I'm doing all that kind of stuff. I have my own account, Melissa Terrace. I now have two and a half thousand followers, which is really scary because if you visualize how many people that is, if they've got a loudspeaker, every time you're saying, I hate this train to two and a half thousand people, you just don't want to go there. But I'm also involved in uh, various other uh, Twitter accounts for our department, for an app that we're releasing called Texel, for the open access journal that I'm an editor of, DH Quarterly, and for the association that I'm secretary of, LLC.org. So yeah, we have a digital presence and a digital outreach. What's this got to do with anything? Well, here's the story. In September last year, I came back from being on leave for a year. I had been on maternity leave with my twins, and I came back, and like most things, when you go away from an institution for a year, things change. The university systems change. And we were given the diktat that we were supposed to put all our stuff now in UCL Discovery, the institutional repository. I also had to update all my web pages because we'd gone to a new content management system. Now this kind of thing is incredibly tedious and boring to be told to do because actually my job is to teach and to research and to do admin. We're forward looking, we're forward thinking, we're not necessarily as academics looking backwards at the research we have done, we're chasing the next research grant. So, a little bit boring, especially thinking about trawling through all my personal archives, backups, CD-ROMs, sculling about different offices to try and find 30 papers published over the last, what, 15 years. So that's where I was. So my thing on this is you become a little bit like Mary Poppins, like, let's make this into a game. If you're going to have to do this, <laughs> let's try and make it fun. So I thought, well, why don't we join up some of this stuff? I'll try and dig out all my papers, and I will use my blog to talk about the papers, and I will tweet them, and I'll try and do one a week. A, it gives me some content from my blog. B, I think sometimes when you publish research, you know, we're publishing about the use of digital resources in libraries, blah, 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 blah. But it can be a really interesting backstory to the paper. So on my blog, I wanted to talk about the backstory to papers. Things like, I wrote this because I had to get funding to go to a conference, so I had to have a paper, so I had to do this. So it's utterly crazy. It's not my normal stuff, but there was a reason why I wrote this and how it ended up as it was. Those kind of stories. So, um, uh, and I've told for each of the things I've published the kind of interesting or funny thing that happened in the project that you wouldn't normally hear about. And then I um, put it up on my blog. So this is about how I wrote a paper called Digital Curiosities Resource Creation via Amateur Digitization. So it's about people that run their own museums online, the kind of crazy stuff about uh, early record labels or kitchens in the 1950s or cheese. You know, they have their own museums and I wrote a kind of serious academic overview of what these people are doing in relation to contemporary museum culture. Um, and I got the idea for this when I was up at 3 a.m. in the morning with a screaming baby going, I need to put a conf thing in for this conference or I won't be allowed to go. And so it's slightly different to all the stuff I did. So this is the backstory behind it. And I put it up and I put a link to my paper in our institute institutional repository rather than on the website of the publishers. So I had started to link back to the stuff in our institutional repository. What I didn't really expect was the response to this. It became very clear to me that this was a way to dramatically increase my downloads of my work. 
So at first, when anything went live in the institutional repository, it got maybe one download a week, no matter how long it was up there for, because some things were up there for three or four months before I mentioned them on my blog and on Twitter. And one person a week would be finding it. Our institutional repository, you can Google stuff and it comes up. So people were not really finding stuff even through that channel, never mind going to the institutional repository and, and access, actually looking for things. But as soon as I put something on Twitter, I would get anything in the region of generally on average about 100 downloads, sometimes up to two or 300 downloads in a day. So that's people clicking through to the PDF to download the PDF of my paper. And this is the general trajectory. So you put it, uh, it goes live, no one, no one looks at it. You tweet it, suddenly you get 140 downloads. At the weekend, guess what? People aren't really on Twitter or they aren't using Twitter for research so much at the weekend. So hint, don't tweet stuff at the weekend. Um, and if you tweet it again, you know, on the Monday you tweeted it again and again, 140 more downloads from different users. Then there's a long tail of people kind of coming back to find it. I think the long tail is caused by A, other people retweeting, but B, the fact that I have talked at length about this research paper on my blog, so that when people are searching for that kind of topic, they not only find the paper, but they find my blog post, and that is another end. So it is increasing the findability of the stuff through social media. Um, sometimes things happen, like here, I don't know why, Lots of people downloaded it that day. You, sometimes you just can't tell through the kind of mechanics we know about understanding how people use downloads. Sometimes you get a spike and you have absolutely no idea where that source was. Even though you're looking at Google Analytics going, I have no idea why suddenly today 80 people downloaded my paper. Meh. Whew, who's to argue? It's all good, right? So I wrote this little blog post and uh, over 4,000 people looked at it. And it really was just that graph of, look, if you put stuff online, people look at it. It's not rocket science. It's not even information science, much as I wish it was. <laughs> um, do you know, it, it's just a case of putting stuff online and it, then suddenly you make it more available. People are actually there. They're actually looking at it. And I did that across all, I did 28 out of my 30 publications. And you can see that I hadn't put anything online. Then come October when I started this, look, there I am. When I tweet stuff, bam, bam, bam. Lots of downloads, lots of downloads, lots of downloads. This is the top 10 papers from my department in the past year. The stats from the top 10 papers. And I have seven out of 10 of the top 10 <laughs> downloads. There are currently 25 members of staff in my department. And there are another 20 or so who are logged on in the institutional repository. So nearly 50 people have put their stuff from our department in the institutional repository but people are only downloading my stuff because I'm the only person talking about my stuff. I'm the only person blogging about it, I'm the only person tweeting about it. I am not for a second saying that my research is any A more important or B better than any of my colleagues stuff. Everyone's doing fantastic things, my colleagues are wonderful but a lot of them are not, a lot of them are, to be honest, are really disparaging about my use of Twitter. I have been told both in writing on email and in staff meetings about how it's such a waste of time. So this, my friends, this was very nice to show them. <laughs> so here are some stats. Most of the papers that I put up, they were downloaded about 100 times within 24 hours of me starting to talk about them online. And I did tweet them, I did blog them, and I would put them on Facebook, a lot of my colleagues are on Facebook, and I would share it on Google Plus as well. So uh, that, those are the kind of places that I'm hanging out. Um, of the over 6,000 downloads from our department in, in the last year, a third of those were for me. So I am having, even though there's 30 odd colleagues and another 20, so of the 50 colleagues, I'm, I have a third of the downloads for our, for our whole department. And out of the top 50 downloads in our department in the entire last year, 27 of them are mine. So all of my papers that I put online in the institutional repository are in the top downloads for our department. If you tell people about your research, they look at it. It's not rocket science. Your research will get looked at more than papers which are not promoted via social media. So it all goes hand in hand. Open access is just one thing. But we see this, and this links back into my research on digitization. We, there's a thing in digitization called scan and dump, which in the early 2000s people were, let's scan in this collection of old stuff. If we put it online, they will come and look at it. It's not true. You put stuff online, no one comes unless you're actively promoting it. And it's exactly the same for stuff in open access repositories. Unless you're promoting the stuff and saying, hey, this is really cool, look at this, and actually guiding people towards stuff, 
they don't find it. And if you do, you can see the spikes in access. It's simple. It's really simple. Timing is important, though. The world still does go to sleep. Uh, uh, Twitter doesn't really wake up before 11 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time because, uh, well, we'll talk about vast swathes of Twitter, because you want to wait till America comes online before you start tweeting stuff. So you don't really want to send stuff out until about 11 o'clock till the East Coast of America is awake. You don't want to tweet new things at midnight UK time because UK is asleep, so you want to time your stuff to when people are actually most using it. You don't want to tweet important things on a Friday, and I saw this, I have graphs for each time I did one of this, looking at how papers <coughs> flopped and died. If you tweet important things on a Friday, they just don't get retweeted enough. But if you tweet them on a Tuesday, you get a much more longer tail. So, you know, this is basic kind of, so even search engine optimization, it's just basic social media management. People have known this for a long time. And it applies to research as well as to press releases for, you know, Rihanna's latest album or whatever. It's exactly the same. We want to be timing when we're telling people and how we're telling people stuff. I was interested in um, looking at the difference between my downloads of a paper from our open access repository to the downloads from the journal where it is behind a paywall. Luckily enough, I am on the board of one of the journals, LOC journal, which is the biggest journal in digital humanities in my field. So I managed to get the stats for that. Um, my paper, Digital Cur Curiosities, the one about amateur digitization, was downloaded over a thousand times. It's now much more than that from our institutional repository. Um, which makes it the 16th most downloaded paper from our institutional repository in the final quarter of 2011. <laughs> oh yeah. But you know, I'm up against people that are, I'm talking about, you know, amateur museums online, the cheese museum, the carrot museum, and people are talking about the obesity and fat tax and how we can solve cancer. And that's the other papers that are being downloaded at UCL, do you know? So there's a limited spread and interest in, in kind of the things I'm writing about. So actually to get into the top 20 paper downloads in our institutional repository is a huge thing from someone from the arts and humanities. So we have to be realistic over what we're expecting from all this. Um, it was the third most downloaded paper in UCL's entire arts faculty in the past year. The other two were from an author in Spanish. Um, and, but if we compare that to the print journal, an LLC journal, which is an Oxford University Press journal, it was the most downloaded paper in 2011. So that had been the, it was the most successful paper that was in from their entire back catalogue, not just printed that year, um, in 2011. But it only had 376 full text downloads from the paywall. That was the best, the most downloaded paper in the journal. But our open access repository had downloaded nearly three times as much from there. So what can I extrapolate from that? Hint, it's a really good idea to make your work open access. People really want to read it, but you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You all believe in that, I hope. Um, more people will read it than if it's behind a paywall. Again, not rocket science, but actually having these figures to compare and contrast what the differences are. Um, open access makes something even more accessible. We all know about that. But then you can say, aha, what's your control? You might just have written something nice that lots of people wanted to read. So what I did, and I apologise to this poor little paper, for one of the projects that I blogged and tweeted about, we'd published four outcomes. Uh, I put all four papers up in the institutional repository, and I only blogged and tweeted about three of them. So I sacrificed one of my papers on the altar of social media. Let's see if you can guess which one didn't get talked about online. So we have library and information resources and users of digital resources and humanities with 297 downloads. Coming in at number two, documentation and users of digital resources and humanities with 209 downloads. If you build it, will they come with 142 downloads? And the master builders, Lyra Research on Good Practice with 12 downloads. So that was the paper that I didn't tell anybody about. I just put it up on the IR and left it for six months. It's a huge difference, right? I mean, I'm not Justin Bieber. We're not talking about reaching a million people with Twitter or re reaching a huge swathe of people. But there are people coming to download this stuff if we talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, then no. People aren't just making an effort to come and find it. Um, but downloads, right? What does that actually mean? I mean, someone's clicked on a link. They've downloaded a PDF. We can tell through Google Analytics that people stay for a minute on my website, on my blog, 
we can't tell if people have actually read it. We certainly can't tell if people have cited it. And this is going to be the proof of the pudding. Um, at the moment, I have an H index and an I10 index like everybody else. It's, it's for an arts and humanities person who's at the relative early stages of the career. That's fine. Do you know, I'm quite happy with how I'm doing. Um, but how has this putting my stuff online changed how much it's going to be cited? That I cannot tell you because this is something I've only been doing from October, November, December, January, February. So here we are, two months later. Can I tell the, how difference that's going to make on, on my citations? No, because it's going to take one, two, three years for anyone to publish and cite my papers because of the length of the publishing process. So it's something I'm going to have to revisit. If we look at the stats for digital curios curiosities resource creation via amateur digitization, it's been downloaded over 1,500 times now, but it's only got three citations. So that's the figure I'm watching to see whether or not that actually changes and whether or not there is a correlation between how viral a paper goes and how viral something like that goes versus actually do people then cite your stuff further down the line and it will take a couple of years to, to actually see that. I have sacrificed another paper on the altar and I have not put it in the open access repository so that I can actually compare and contrast. In five years' time, how much citation is something that did go open access and something that didn't went? Sorry, little paper. It needed to be done. So I wrote up this blog post, and you kind of put it on your blog, and you could send it out at midnight because I was on a deadline for something else, and you kind of go on holiday for three weeks. And before you know, it's been looked at over 10,000 times, and it's been featured in the Times Higher. And uh, here, uh, this went a wee bit viral when I was away. Um, and for an academic thing, again, not Justin Bieber, but for to have 10,000 people come and read something that you've written is, is fantastic. It's fantastic outreach and fantastic impact. And I'm, I'm very surprised about this because to me, it's not surprising really that if you put stuff up and if you tweet it, people will come and look at it. But I think it took someone actually doing it and showing a graph and the graph was the thing that people like most to say, look, it is worth it. It is worth the investment of time to do this. And it was from people the, from all over the world who came and looked at this blog post. So it's international. It's not just the UK and the States, although those are the prime. Outfit. But we have uh, users looking at this. I'm very big in U Ukraine for some reason. And um, <laughs> uh, Africa and South America. So it is international. We have international visitors coming to look at this, coming to download, download papers. But you'd expect that. It's open access. It's free. It's available. You expect the whole world to want it if you want. My issue with all this stuff, though, is it's great to mess about on the internet, and it was really good to have an excuse to get my act together on my institutional systems and get my web pages all sorted out and all that. Yay, the internet! But my job is to actually write research papers and to be forward thinking. And it's only recently that we've been told that we should now start gardening our back catalogue as well. Before you publish it onto the next thing, you publish it onto the next thing. Before people started to think about all this, we weren't in charge of curating our own history and making sure that people were citing something that you wrote in 2003. I'm thinking already about the papers I'm publishing this year, next year, and the year after. I don't really, it's a whole mind switch to think about looking after the papers you've already published. Even from an academic point of view, even having to go through and trawl through the last 14, 15 years of my own research, trying to find the pre-print copies of stuff to be able to put in the open access project, that wasn't a small task. And if Universities are asking people to do this. When are we getting the extra time to do it? Oh, there's a surprise. We're not getting any extra time. We're still expected to do all the things we were doing already, but we're supposed to be doing this as well. So there is an issue and there's a tension there. Obviously, I'm a great fan of the internet. I'm a great fan of social media, but we have to be careful about how much we're asking people to do and how that's changing what they're doing in, in the time frame. And I haven't heard much today about users and actual academics and what it means for an actual academic to sit and look out 30 papers and put them in an open access repository. So I think there needs to be a little bit more thought about users and the implications for the people who are expected to do this on top of their own workload. But to conclude, really, um, I, I think I, uh, this is a product of a certain time. I think all I have done in this is join some dots. There is open access. We have open access at my institution. It wasn't a big fight to put stuff online. 
I have a social presence, and all I did was join the dots between them. The important thing is I didn't just set up a social presence to get people to download my stuff. My social presence was already set up before I went, hey people, here's one of my papers, have a look at it. I have quite a lot of followers on, on Twitter because I'm addicted to Twitter and I have been for the last three or four years. So it's the kind of product that if I then put a link online, some people click on it. It is not something that is an end in itself and people have to be careful that if they want people to find and read your research, you have to build a digital presence in your discipline and then you can use it to promote your work. You can't promote your work by building a digital presence. It doesn't work like that. You have to, if you want to live by the sword, you have to live by the sword when you have something interesting to share. So my conclusion to all this is, if your social media interaction is often, then if you put open access and social media together, you get increased downloads. So I am encouraging any of my colleagues and academic colleagues to work on their social media presence, to work on their digital presence, and then use that when they have something interesting to say. It's by far the easiest and simplest way to reach out to the world, to tell people about your research. I do most of my writing in a shed at the bottom of my garden, and it's really pleasing to know that I'm sitting at the bottom of my garden writing, but there's people in Ukraine downloading my papers. You know, that's nice, and we can do that now very easily through social media. So, my conclusion really is, yes, digital presence for ac academics, we have to find the time to actually update it and keep it and maintain it. But linking through to open access and linking this together is a very easy way to disseminate our work. Thanks very much. Thank you.